name is Mike Grain. Welcome back to another podcast on On Shelf Availability, sponsored by Conversations on Retail and the University of Arkansas Supply Chain Department. Today, we are going to be talking to a bunch of experts in the RFID and food industry. Uh, RFID is certainly very valuable for being able to track inventory of what you have and where it's located. But it's also being used by folks in the foods area, whether it's quick service restaurants or in grocery stores, to be able to track uh, aged inventory for markdowns or quick sale, uh, and also other things uh, for production planning purposes. Uh, join me today as we speak with uh, Avery Dennison, Mr. Adam Anderson from Avery Dennison, uh, Justin Patton from the Auburn RFID Board, and Jonathan Gregory from GS1 about the opportunities of leveraging the RFID technology in the food area. Let's get started. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Good uh, good morning, wherever you happen to be. Uh, my name is Mike Grain, and we've got a really fun topic that we're going to talk about today. Uh, the topic is the RFID, or radio frequency identification, in the food industry. Uh, we're joined on the podcast with uh, a very, very uh, knowledgeable group about both RFID and food. So we're going to kick it over, and uh, we'll turn, well, at least in my thing right here, upper left-hand corner, Justin Patton, you want to unmute and uh, introduce yourself? Uh, yes, my name is uh, Justin Patton. I'm the director of the Auburn University RFID Lab. been doing this for uh, many, many years with uh, retail, aviation, aerospace, um, and now the food industry as well. Perfect. Adam Anderson, you're up next. Sure, Adam Anderson, Global Vice President for Food for Avery Dennison's Identification Solutions Business. Um, prior to that, spent some time with Information Resources Incorporated, syndicate, big syndicated data for retailers and, and CPGs. And then prior, a variety of roles with Walmart from, I yeah, grew up in the stores, but leadership roles in strategy, innovation, frontline operations, merchant operations, all really centered around how do you improve the customer experience, the associate experience while driving sales and profitability? Yeah, I'm going to pick on Adam for a second. When Adam was out in uh, Colorado, he invited me to go on a store visit with him. And I was fascinated because he was leading this group of associates who really thought they had the best store ever and we should be the best store and we're the best store in the a whole market in the region, et cetera. Adam looks down at a basically a bunch of vegetables. He reaches down to the bottom of it. He picks out one that looks a little bit bruised and a little bit shouldn't have been there. It should have been called and thrown away. He go, looked at the store manager and said, would you buy this? The guy was said, no. He goes, well, then our customers shouldn't either. Get rid of it. What's your question about the best run store in the market? It was just hilarious. It was classic. He then looked over at the rotisserie chicken case said, see those chickens? He goes, yeah. He says, see all those dirty fingerprints on the glass? Would you buy a chicken from this place? He was just one after another after another. I learned everything. I learned so much in that one day, just watching him around. And his basic thing is, can you look at this particular business in the eyes of a customer? I thought it was a great visit. It has nothing to do with RFID and food, but that was one of my, my favorite vi uh, memories of Adam. Mr. Gregory, I don't have any favorite memories of you. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully. Wow, that's that's pretty rough. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my name is John Gregory. I've been with GS1 US about four years before that, deploying RFID solutions as a program manager for 13 years, first in aerospace and then in retail. I uh, absolutely love my job, love talking about this and advancing uh, the RFID standards that are out there. So uh, very, very happy to be here. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. And you know, I was only kidding about the favorite memory. My favorite memory was the 27 chip meetings that we had to present for uh, chip results, Justin, you and, and, and Jonathan and I. Yeah. Good times. Uh, and myself, Mike Grain, I've been in the industry for about 40 years, uh, spent 25 years with Parker and Gamble, spent about eight with Walmart, then went to Crossmark. So I've had a chance to see both from a CPG standpoint, from a retailer standpoint, and from a third party service and now I'm doing my own work uh, in the consulting space on on-shelf availability and at least part of my time on the RFID initiative. So enough for the introductions, just want to give you guys an opportunity to, to basically talk a little bit about RFID. And, I, and I'll, I'll probably start this out with you, Adam. Uh, RFID has usually been thought of 
as an apparel or a, maybe in a broader case, a general merchandise. Um, so now suddenly we're starting to talk about technologies like RFID and food. What exactly are the u- use cases in for food from both a retail and then from a food service industry standpoint? Sure. Thanks, Mike. So I think, you know, you mentioned one of them, which is inventory accuracy, tried and true. We've heard about for years, very mature in the marketplace and, and inventory management from a accuracy from a case level verification or at a unit level cycle count. So that could be, you know, if you think through creating that digital twin for physical products, now counting activities move from one to one to one to many with really high accuracy. And, and you get all the efficiencies and sales lift and turns associated with that. So, so that's number one is, is just that pure inventory accuracy. Next though, is moving and, and really starting to leverage the full capabilities of, of digitization. So now you get into freshness and expiring management and now adding the addition of extended item attribution like lot, sell by, use by, best by, all all of that information. Um, And those those processes, expiry processes and freshness processes, which you you described back in my less mellow times of, it's been a contact sport. Um, And really now moving a lot of those processes from one to one to one to many, and also from a first in first out to first expiry first out. So really getting into an extremely high level of detail around managing inventory to ensure freshness. If you think about kind of that that one to one, one to many of at a QSR quick service restaurant, it's the middle of the day, truck's been making multiple stops, there's customers in the store, that truck arrives, you've got to unload it. And, and victory today is it just gets in the building. And you know most of the quick service restaurants have guidelines around days of, of usage left in product. And you know, can you really get to that level of detail during, during the thick of the business? And now with RFID being able to really simplify those processes, identify, you know, is the product within the tolerances that are expected? And then think about grocery, you described you're in a grocery store today, if you're checking date codes, rotation, um, days of freshness, today that is a a very long hands-on one-to-one process that now through technology can be automated and um, done with tremendous speed compared to how we've grown up in the industry. And then I think as, as we move through, you, you start to see, and, and before I move away from that, I think one of the things you see in the industry now, especially in, in Europe, we're starting to see where grocers have historically, you know, battled on price and we're seeing freshness being that new, um, you know, point of differentiation where, where grocers are making freshness guarantees that say we guarantee five days of freshness for this product but they're doing it in a, in a very manual process today that, that we see this transition happening to more digitized solutions to enable that. Um, and then as we move across the supply chain, now traceability, recall, and, and we'll talk about food safety, um, but this value of digitization increases as we move upstream to the supplier community distributor um, all the way up, all the way to the farm. Um, and so recall processes today are, are very manual and, and tend to be either the, the retailer pulls everything off the shelf, regardless of lot, date, anything, it's just, it's all gone or they don't pull enough. And so now it can be very surgical and one, not generate excessive food waste, two, not lose sales that don't need to be lost. Um, you've got electronic verification of all the inbound, outbound, the recalls. Um, and as well as we look across the supply chain, looking at, at dwell time visibility, really enabling upstream decisions, process improvement. So, you know, again, re- recall efficiency and again, waste reduction, big, big benefits there. And then finally, my God, as we think about sustainability, sustainability, and I think everybody's got their their ESG goals. Now you're able to really, as you digitize the product, um, 
you know, you've, you're starting to understand the environmental impact through measurement. So not only did I save X heads of lettuce, but the, the road, the road, the miles that weren't on the road, the, the liters of water that weren't used to produce the product that ended up being thrown away. Now you can start to understand your true impact or across um, the supply chain all the way, you know, um, and measuring that by product, by supplier to really understand the impact that one's making globally. Got it. When you talk about some of these uh, use cases, Adam, I'm assuming you're not just talking about pure play grocery stores. I'm saying I'm thinking you're talking about anybody who sells grocery. It could be mass, could be club, could even potentially be, you know, uh, you know, drug store channels that are selling, for, you know, some kind of food. Right. Absolutely. OK. OK. So, Justin, he mentioned something in there I think you probably have a lot of experience for, because I know a lot of people are going. I don't want you to disclose who you're working with unless that's appropriate to do. But the quick service restaurant industry, uh, they are starting to look at RFID for some of the same kind of uses. Is there any is there any other builds that you have on the as it relates to quick QSRs? You're on mute, Justin. <laughs> Thank you. So, um you know, QSR is clearly there's a, a there's a, a labor issue involved because there's just so many doors, right? I mean, um, retail is a lot of locations, but restaurants are even more. Um, you can have tens of thousands of, of uh, doors in a single chain, and um, that's a lot of people out there working in those locations. And you know, labor is not as easy to get a hold of as it used to be in the past. So I think there's definitely a little bit of pressure to uh, make sure that we're being more efficient especially out there at the, uh, the edge of the, the chain before stuff's going home with uh, uh, customers. And I also think that there's more pressures on the um, on supply chain in general because uh, there's been a move to fresher foods, right? So I, most of the bigger chains don't really use frozen beef the way that they used to, you know, five, 10 years ago. So you've kind of shortened your, your life cycle and, and you've um, put a little bit more pressure on the supply chain. But then you're also trying to be much more efficient with labor out there uh, and making sure that we're handling um, the, um, the product appropriately. So I think those things really make QSR more advantaged. Um, anything that can allow them to keep a uh, inventory or a solid uh, inventory count without putting a lot of people going back there and checking lists or scanning barcodes is great. And, um, and I also think that the, the, the word barcode, like it's interesting there's very few industries we've ever come across when it comes to the world of pure RFID, where in, in some of these instances, you kind of leapfrog the whole barcode thing altogether. Um, there's a lot of products out there that are in supply chain, especially in QSR, that don't have any kind of barcodes on them. They're, 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 the case is made to the product for a single SKU, and then there will be like some kind of a lot and expiration code that gets sprayed on there, but we don't have any type of um, real case tracking system at all. And to what Adam was saying earlier about recalls and things like that, that really makes it a, a big challenge. So sometimes when we're adding um, RFID into these products that are going through the supply chain, it really is, it's not just an upgrade to what they were already doing. This is a whole new world. A lot of this stuff is really being serialized and identified for the first time. So that's kind of exciting too, because it's not an efficiency gain at that point. It is a, is a whole new data stream that didn't exist before. So um, um, anyway, there's there's a lot more to it than that, I think. But uh, QSRs are, are their own little unique world. And and the last thing I'll say on that is, you know, when you think about restaurants, in my mind, I always think about them as, you know, a restaurant that you go to. But even in retail chains, like a Kroger or, or a Walmart or, or Sam's or whatever, they have essentially a restaurant in those retail stores because they have the deli counter and they're doing food prep and serve there at the at the at the store so there's a lot of um i don't say bleed over but it's a lot of close collaboration there, there's a lot that we can um with those supply chains start coming together and merging uh, much more quickly than they do in uh, some of the other industries where the channels tend to be more divergent gotcha yeah. Hey, Jonathan, I'm going to switch it over to you. Um, yeah. So I heard Adam say using RFID for date encoded or aged product, rotation, freshness, et cetera. Last time I checked, 
in a SG-10, there is no place for a date. So how is that possible today? Yep. And are there future GS-1 standards that are, are going to enable that to be much easier to do? Yeah, uh, happy to answer that. If I can first just add to what Justin and Adam just spoke to, um, just thinking about if I'm a manufacturer of something, if I put an RFID tag on it, I add value to my product. I differentiate my product, right? And, and you're hitting upon this, but uh, some of the use cases include like this improved business planning, uh, being able to address shipping error uh, issues before they happen, right? And, and so by, by doing that, and, and Adam talked about waste reduction as well, but even the, the Kurgit being picked up, if I can use this uh, more rich data to be able to drive, hey, I'm only going to have my garbage picked up when the bin is full because of all this rich data I have, uh, I think that's just fascinating. The other thing I'll mention is there's something unique about quick serve restaurants in that you have limited time offers. So you can actually drive demand up higher because you have excess supply, which is really mm -hmm. interesting. Um, and then also the operational efficiencies. I just thought there's one really ex uh, interesting example of, say, uh, a meat that is palletized and a distributor or, or operator having to break down that pallet to barcode scan each one of those items and then rebuild the pallet. All that labor that went into it because they couldn't get line of sight data uh, or they required line of sight data. So, so that's really interesting. But to your point, Mike, uh, yeah, the SG-1096, it's been used in the apparel and general merchandise space. It's very widely used. It has your product identifier and your serial number. It does not have your batch lot or your date, such as an expiration date or say something like a net weight. Uh, very exciting news coming out as of August, uh, the TAG data standard. So the, the global standard that governs how data is structured in RFID tags has been updated with these specific business needs in mind. And so they allow what's new, it's a SG-10 plus. Uh, so instead of SG-1096, there's an SG-10 plus uh, encoding scheme that allows you to stack up and add this information. There's also a DSG-10 plus, which is date prioritized. So uh, it, it is uh, prioritized for uh, management of expiry and things like that. So very exciting development uh, in industry. So in other words, from a practical standpoint, if I'm a retailer, I don't have to scan a serialized G10 with an RFID reader, go find a database somewhere where the date is there. It could actually be incorporated into TAG without changing any of the uniqueness of the serialized G10, right? Exactly. I can be yeah. off network and still read this data and be able to leverage it. Um, and uh, you think about all of the items flowing this, through the supply chain and all of the supply chain participants, there are standards and ways to get to that data for sure, but that could be overwhelming to be able to have to look up for every single item. I wanna find the batch lot and cross-reference and get this uh, in real time as I'm you know, in motion. That could be a real challenge. And so I'm really excited that, that this new mechanism is made available. So not to put you on the spot, but what are some of the attributes in this extended SG-10, SG-10 Plus, that would be relevant for potential food and expiry product? Do you have a couple of examples of that? Sure. Yeah. The examples would be, say, the batch lot. So that's very important to the uh, uh, the KDEs for uh, FISMA 204 compliance, for example. Uh, but then also the, the value of various dates. You know, the, uh, Adam had mentioned several of these dates earlier, you know, the, the expiry or packed on or best buy or, you know, there's a array of dates. But basically, or, or net weight is another one, like we're talking about the example with the, mm -hmm. uh, the beef, the, the palletization, so they can pull off the, the net weight value, which is very important. Um, but basically, uh, any application identifier. So there's a library, hundreds of application identifiers are out there. And so uh, a senior GS1 global office executive commenting on this said that we're getting standards out of the way of innovation, which I think is really mm. a powerful statement. Yeah. They say we're making this dynamic, we're making it able to, to adjust and, and deal with. So, so we're removing this kind of static element that, that, that held the industry in place here. That's great. That's yeah. great. So, so Adam, I've got a question for you. Well, one question and one comment. I think the other one from my perspective that also values RFID in food is those particular facilities that actually manufacture product. So for example, baking cakes, baking bread, baking cookies, whatever. 
Sometimes I think that they're because of the on hands being inaccurate, they're making a production schedule based on th what they think they have. And guess what, Justin, that's no different than socks, right? So the better job you can get your product, what you have and your sales forecast, I would imagine you actually bake things that you need versus what you think you need. Um, the, the, the industry, one of the questions I got before this uh, by somebody who couldn't be here, and I thought it was a very good question, which is, the, the Food Safety Modernization Act is, is how do retailers and producers leverage RFIDs to support FSMA regulations? And sure. that's probably an Adam and Jonathan question. Yeah, and I heard Jonathan touch on it. So first and foremost, there's a huge caveat with this, which is the FDA won't formally announce the final details until November 7th. So <laughs> any and everything we talk about is what we know to this point. Um, and it's only a week away. It's only a week away, Adam. It's only yeah, a week away. A week and a half, <laughs> you know? So, so just have to have that caveat that says, Fair enough. um, look, so, um, FISMA 204 is all about food traceability. And so, um, really applies across the entire supply chain with the exception of the end consumer and, and across each stop of the supply chain, it, each entity is responsible for the events that occur under their watch. So if you think about receiving, shipping, internal you know, transformation of product, each one of those will, will have to be tracked. And as Jonathan talked about, the FDA is gonna provide a list of key data elements and critical tracking events for a specified list of food items that are at high risk for foodborne illness. So a lot of leafy greens, raw eggs, things, you know, um, a lot of uh, fish, um, shellfish, things along those lines. Um, and then each entity is gonna be required to capture master data. So the things we're very accustomed to around product ID, food classification codes, you know, it's an egg, it's fish. Um, supplier name, and then and then variable data points, and that's the variable data points is probably the piece that that is going to be new to to many around capturing, receiving, shipping that transformation, date, time, lot, product identification, and and within this, um, as as the FDA reaches out, um, you know each entity is required to reply. Um, digitally to the FDA within 24 hours. So, um, and, and each member of the supply chain is responsible. Uh, if I can, I'll pause for a moment and I'll, I'll go through an example, but really from an RFID perspective, RFID is a data carrier just and can share data, you know, as it travels through that supply chain. So as we think about all the, the you know, value uh, all the value that it creates applies in this instance as well from, you know, the ability to read one to many doesn't require line of sight um, and, and being able to transfer that data digitally or across the supply chain. But this can get really complex. And so I, I, I partnered with um, someone just to talk me through, give me a, a real life example of how challenging this could be. And so we, we talked about, used a great example of commissaries and you've have a commissary that makes a chicken salad sandwiches. And for those sandwiches, they think their, their secret ingredient is their mayonnaise that really makes it distinguished. That mayonnaise is made with raw eggs. The raw eggs are, are more than likely going to be on that item list. You have to receive the eggs, so that's an event. Those eggs get turned into mayonnaise that's an event and now it's a new product that needs all the product information. Mm. That, that mayonnaise is now going into a sandwich, which is now another product that has to be tracked and have its own unique identification. So you can very quickly see how, how large this can grow and the detail that's required um, to, to be in compliance. Yeah. Hey, we've got some eggs at a specific farm that are being recalled. Right. What mayonnaise did they go into? Right. Who in the world right. knows today? <laughs> right. So you've got to go. Well, where are people getting sick? Right. Farm. Where are people getting sick? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Wow. That's tremendous. 
So it, it maybe this kind of takes a, a different turn of our questions because I think, you know, Justin, we've been working 20 years on RFID at retail, specifically apparel and general merchandise, et cetera. I'm hoping we don't get 20 years before we see broad scale of adoption of this technology or other technologies for food. What you guys' uh, thoughts on, you know, how are we gonna how are we gonna get adoption sooner than the what has taken us to get it up and running in apparel and general merchandise? Um, that's an interesting question. I don't know. The, the volumes are changed, right, from an industry perspective. So, you know, retail is such a huge number of um, RFID tag units per year compared to some of these other industries. So from an innovation perspective, I think a lot of the market kind of tends to be so focused on retail products just because that's where the most units that flow through are because we're not talking in food about tracking individual chicken nuggets. We're talking about tracking cases of other things as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that it, that's, that's a good thing and a bad thing. You know, it's a good thing in a way because it's not hard to go out there and be able to tag up most of the stuff that, that is coming down the supply chain, especially when it comes to uh, QSR and even in grocery supply chain, like the volumes are easily absorbable. Um, the technology's come a long way. Um, we've had a good chance to tick the, kick the tires and work out a lot of the kinks on some of these other products that we've been tagging up till now. So it's not so much of a, and I don't, I don't want to say this in the wrong way, but I don't, it's not so much of an innovation project. It's not a moonshot anymore. It's just a deployment of a tool, right? Mm. Which is kind of good. And I, I know a lot of people would probably take exception. It's like, no, my company's very innovative. It is, but we don't, some people don't want this to be an innovation project. They want this to be, here's a tool. I need to go solve this problem. Let's go get it done. So um, I feel like that there's a little bit more uh, constancy and consistency. There's a little bit, there's a lot more confidence in the technology, which helps in a lot of ways too. So I think that um, we've short circuited many, many years of learning from some of the other industries and deployments that are kind of helping us uh, uh, to make some more accelerated leaps when it comes to uh, a food supply chain uh, tracking. Hmm. Adam, your thoughts? Same, same, same question. How do we, how do yeah, we drive adoption? Yes, I agree with Justin. I think there is, there's, it's been a journey. I mean, we've, we've all been part of that. I think there's a little bit of an outdated talk track for those on the, on the food industry that may have been in the periphery that we may need to bring up to speed on as, as Justin talked about the evolution of the technology. This, this isn't a moonshot. Here's where we are, but but there, there's still some um, historical pricing models or things that are out there that, that aren't true today. Um, two is, is some of it's just about timing. There, when you visit with folks in, in the food industry, it's, there's so much happening today and has been since you know, the pandemic started from you know, all of the prioritization around, you know, online grocery or mobile fulfillment, mobile ordering to really investing in, in media that, you know, how does this fit into all the technology that, that they're being really bombarded with today from computer vision to mathematical solutions to how does RFID fit? And, and the, the thing is just being able to articulate, look, but RFID will meet them where they are and integrate into their existing processes. This isn't, doesn't have to be a complete reinvention unless it's, unless that's where the industry needs to be. Hmm. Um, so I, I think it's really just ensuring as an industry, we're taking the time, understand the needs of, of where each business is and, and how, we, how we help solve their business needs. This isn't a technology looking for a problem rather than we're, we're just here to solve business problems. Yep, absolutely. So Justin, if if we think about just the tag availability, uh, we know you have got a set of ARC standards for things that go in a cardboard box or things that go on a shirt or whatever. Now we're talking about lettuce containers on a wet wall or radishes or whatever the product happens to be or cookies that are in a steel you know, or aluminum <clears throat> container that have a plastic cover on it. Um, what do we, how do you think about just in terms of the, 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 I guess the RF part of the radio frequency, do we have tags that'll work? Do we have solutions for some of these use cases? And let me throw out one more, 
is that whole lovely one, which is if you put it on packaged meat and somebody puts packaged meat into a microwave, what happens? So I know we have solutions for that, but I think it'd be helpful to, to your audience to kind of share for both Adam and Justin, uh, what, what have you guys already thought about that? And if so, what are the answers for those problems? You know, the physics of it is, I think people are a little smarter and more responsible when it comes to the physics of it. So first off, the tags have gotten a lot better and they continue to get better every year. So in terms of performance, putting tags on most of the stuff you mentioned is, is not a concern as long as we're doing it reasonably. So like most people understand, hey, we're going to put a tag on a case. We're going to do case inventory in a warehouse or, you know, through a receiving door or something like that. That's no problem. The problem comes in when some people the company outside to say, hey, I'm going to put an RFID tag on everything. And they expect to read a giant pile of, you know, shrink wrapped meat. And that's not going to happen, right? It, we're not going to scan through, you know, a, a solid piece of water, essentially, to get to tags on the other side. So, but I think that at this point, we've had enough experience and we're smart enough as, as an industry to be able to give some good, quick guidance on what is and isn't going to work. And our, the moral of, in RFID, you can put a tag on anything with enough money, right? So but we want to mm -hmm. make sure that you want to do it within reason so that it's going to be something that's affordable and scalable. So I feel like um, the solution set is there. I feel like the uh, education level is higher so that people know how to more responsibly use the, the proper solutions to get things going. And I also feel like that there's a lot of uh, uh, innovation happening in chip and uh, uh, tag design that's taking us further down the road that's going to help create even um, um quicker solutions for the same problems and products in the future. Yep. Perfect. What about that whole question about RFID tag has, has ink in it that's metal based and we've got microwaves. Any, any solution for that one? <laughs> the microwave. I, you know, that's an interesting one. We've seen that come up a few times with a, uh, uh, especially product that would go home with a, a customer, I guess. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, my best answer to that is like, don't put it on a product that's going to go home with a customer, but I bet you there's a better answer to that further down the line. So I don't know. I, I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's innovation there on this, but um, <laughs> um, um, for the most part, it's been um, use it responsibly, use it where we need it. Most of the use cases have been very heavily focused on, we get a ton of value to extract from the supply chain side, less so on um, the um, immediately customer accept customer accessible item level stuff like out there on the sales floor. It's not like socks and t-shirts. This is a very different scenario here in terms of what we're trying to track. Yeah. Adam, anything he's missed? Yeah, Mike. So as, as Justin talked about, the solutions out there for, you know, whether it's on metal, on liquid, wave there, there are wave safe tags, but again, used responsibly. Um, this is, uh, not meant to be, you know, in your microwave for an hour and a half while you cook something. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and also it is partnering to build out those solutions. So as Justin talked about, hey, reading that giant pallet of, of meat at an item level, that's, that's pretty tough physics to pull off, but you can associate those items to a case or um, an RTI and associate those to a palette and you know your accuracy is 99 100%. So yep. I think um, all of those are just working the problem. Yep. And and to just an example, the meat bunker which is one of my favorite one which is where you can't really read RFID through a whole bunch of basically meat. Well yeah, but if it's that important to you maybe you put a fixed reader in there so as you're actually putting the product in or taking the product out it gets read. So you may not read it all the time but you read it when it goes in and so you know it's probably there as well. So mm -hmm. here's here's the one thing and the audience has I think really has to understand is just because you learned something about RFID 5 years ago, it's probably changed. Capabilities, yeah. it's always evolving. There's new capabilities. There's new ways of thinking about it. There's new ways of solving old problems. You know, the whole, well, it's way too expensive. It'll never work. Well, the tags have continued to come down in cost. And, and uh, so don't just assume because you learned it five years ago of something being true, i.e. it doesn't work with metal and water. The reality is there's some creative ways to work around that yeah, if you want to get into it. Um, so a couple other questions. Um, the first question is, uh, okay, what, what's the future look like? 
Where, where do you see this going? And, and what is the, the respective role of industry experts, standards organizations, and service providers like GS1 uh, and, and, uh, and uh, Avery Dennison to, to help uh, solve some of these problems? Uh, you asking me, Mike? I can hit that if you want. That's, you that's a question ask? for all three of you. All three. All right. I'll jump in. So, so I think it's interesting. The uh, We've used this um, diagram before, this crossing the chasm reference and diagram uh, that's credited back to Jeffrey Moore in the book that he wrote of the same name, right? And so you see that disruptive technology uh, makes its way uh, into the mainstream by getting a foothold in one technology, uh, one industry and becoming widely adopted. And then under, other industries kind of look over and say, oh, they're apparently general merchandise is using RFID. Maybe we'll do that too, right? Um, so at one level, there's, you know, it's been alluded to a lot of the learnings about how RFID works and the infrastructure, such as say the Auburn Lab or the, the GS1 standards or solution providers capabilities, such as what Adam represents as well, right? That's in place. Uh, but what's interesting is that food has uh, some slight differences between apparel with regards to the demands what need happen. For example, uh, much more focus on potentially encoding data at the point of manufacture. And so uh, the industry needs some of those norms, if you will, some of those uh, clarity on supplier requirements. Um, it also needs, and, and I believe it probably has, but one of the interesting things that apparel and aerospace and, and as well had was particular leaders, familiar faces that would stand up at events and say, hi, I'm, you know, Dr. Hardgrave, or I'm Carlo Nizam, or, or who, you know, or I'm, you know, Bill, Bill from Macy's, you know, they would, they would, they would stand up and they say, this is a great technology, we're using it, and you should too. So uh, mm -hmm. it's very interesting as far as the, the different things that, that encourage uh, an industry to realize we're not alone, uh, we're all moving in the same direction together. Um, and so, uh, so I would, I would call that out as kind of a key point, uh, moving forward for industry. Awesome. Yeah. Justin, any thoughts? What's the, what's the role of somebody like that in the, in the, uh, in your, your space in, in terms of helping some of this happen from an adoption standpoint? Well, a university, you know, especially in a role from industry development, especially for the technology industry like this is, uh, Clearly, first and foremost is students, right? So if people are adopting this, then they're growing those respective industries, and hopefully we're providing some students that are going to go out there and work in them. That's our goal at the end of the day. That's our, our product, if you will, if you look at a university like a business. Um, and I think that's been successful, and I think that helps just elevate the general knowledge across the board and experience. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, you know, in terms of working with the different group members, too, I think uh, one of the things that we do is we build confidence. Right. So I feel like a lot of times when people try to learn what's going on with RFID or especially if they're looking for a large suite of technologies and different types of technologies, it's easier to have a university show them what's going on because it's academic. It's neutral. I mean, government employees like we're not really selling anything other than the students that they hope they hire. But um, it tends to lend a little bit more um, credence to, I think, what, what's happening here, too. So uh, I feel like a, a, a lot of our role has been tours, 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 you know, explain, 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 you know, check, validate, check, validate. I feel like a footnote, a human footnote sometimes. So, like, somebody hears something and they call me to check. Is that right? And like, yeah, sure. So, um, um, but I think that's a little bit of our role here is try to, to, try to um, provide um, some context and confidence and hopefully provide some of that future workforce it's really going to make it all all sync awesome adam any closing thoughts for you in terms of adoption and anything else that uh, your organization can do yeah so so one is i think we all have to be students of of the business and understand the end customers needs and and how you know whether it's rfid or a different digitization solution how those solutions really help help solve those problems. I think too, you know, for for us at Avery, it's it's really about, you know, being students of the technology as well. Just just like at Auburn, you know, we we have a lab, we've built a grocery store, we're doing all of those things to ensure that we're truly solving the the, the needs of the end consumer. 
they had a client and and really then it's it's about value creation and we've talked about you know um it's it's not just about you know i can i can hold a scanner or there's a reader and it beeps and it's really cool it's about no look we're truly adding value that that you know processes that used to take hours can be done in minutes and and accuracies you know at near perfect um results um that's meaningful and so i think it's really just about proving out that value right awesome awesome so i got i got one last question we're going to link uh, uh some discussions that, that justin and and jonathan and i had yesterday um, one of the questions that I just got from somebody, which is to, to really understand the risks and the emerging potential downsides to implementation. And the other, the other way of thinking about that is, are our legacy systems today, our ERP, our SAP, our EDI systems equipped to be able to handle level of data at this level? Because we're not looking at this at the UPC level, we're looking at the serialized item level. So what are some of the risks and emerging downsides to implementation if some of the stuff isn't in place already? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and just uh, agree with you that, yeah, there's a gap between your typical legacy system, your your MES, your WMS, your ERP system, and the, the world of data collection that RFID provides. Mm -hmm. RFID often opens people's eyes. Uh, they use that terminology, right? It's like you turn the lights on and now you understand all the things that you did not expect to see are actually happening, right? Mm -hmm. um, but but being able to actually leverage that item level data uh, does require making some hard business decisions uh, that relate to IT governance. You know, where am I going to locate this item level data? Is it going to make its way all the way into my core systems? And you really have to base this on what are my use cases? What are my business drivers? Uh, my business drivers will will help me understand where I should locate uh, this item level data, and in in doing so, help me to kind of architect from that. That's one point. And then the other point I'll make is that uh, the food supply chain uh, is much more uh, integrated than apparel, in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, that that moves you to a, you know, off of square one, almost off of square one to another layer of complexity where you're collecting data, but you want to be able to share that data with trade partners. Uh, so there, there is a GS1 standard for that, the EPCIS standard, which is very helpful in doing so. Uh, I would say the biggest risk is to not be aware of standards and not implement them uh, because then you could build up all this infrastructure and have a very high cost to have to potentially rework it um, or constrain yourself and your ability to to be flexible at that point. So that, those are my comments. Yeah. yeah. And just to just to build on that, let's not go back to the 80s that says, OK, Walmart and the lettuce supplier have their own way of communicating, which is different than every other retailer, because that's not going to help anybody. That's just going to replicate all kinds of difficulty. And this is hard. And boy, this is a big investment. The standards are there for a reason. And Jonathan, I'm really glad GS1 went out and develop these standards before there was really a very clear who's the, who's the customer for this because it's going to be a huge unlock. I yeah. still think there's still a big in, unlock, which is, well, that's great. We have the standards now. We know kind of the artist rendition of what the subdivision is going to look like. We haven't put one pipe in the ground yet. And so trying to connect this stuff with a set of standards that have this capability with a bunch of uh, current infrastructure is going to be really, really tough. Yeah. All right. Um, we got a couple minutes left. Just any other closing comments by any of you? Anything else you guys want to add before we uh, wrap up the podcast? Well, you know, I think that um, making sure that everybody understands how their organization is currently handling data is crucial to this, right? Mm. So um, one of the biggest, probably the biggest cause of, of failure to launch for any of the current, you know, RFID or even some of the QR and CV projects and stuff in the last, you know, 10 years has been a lack of ability to integrate that data back in with their current uh, business. So um, UHF RFID 
you know, we're 17 years in, in the retail supply chain, and still most retailers are receiving blind when they receive the serialized DPC numbers down to the store, which is a, is a major um, missed opportunity. I mean, there's so many retailers, probably most of them now that go out there and count this and they, here's a rich set of serialized data on all the stuff that's in my DC or in my store. And what do we do? We just count the total number, update the on hands and toss that data into a, a repository somewhere, which may never be seen again. So we, we're so addicted to these old systems of, of quantity level accounting that it's very difficult to get beyond that. And I think food has been a little bit further along because they have to, because of many things that Adam and Jonathan mentioned here about the need for date lot and expiration, so on and so forth. But uh, we've got to get past uh, these uh, uh, um, legacy inventory systems and these legacy data exchange systems to really be able to uh, uh, make this something that is going to make a, a significant lasting change. So I think mm -hmm. the first step in that process is for everyone who's considering this or everyone who has a problem to truly sit down and understand like, what is it that we are collecting and using at each point in the supply chain? And even though we may have a process on paper, like is everyone actually doing this or are they kind of circumventing it or are they playing lip service or whatever it may be? And that will help uncover like the, the true, um, not just the value, because value is great, but it also uncover where the true effort is going to be. Because it's, it's, it's terrible to go out there and spend a whole bunch of time and effort and get a bunch of awesome data and then find out that um, you don't really have a good way to uh, uh, ingest it other than a manual system. And then everything kind of slowly um, trickles through. So um, I mm -hmm. think uh, having a good look at ourselves as shippers and as warehouses and as suppliers and as retailers and understanding what it is we do and don't know before we move into uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, new projects is, is very helpful in making sure that they're successful. Great. Adam, got any closing thoughts for us? You know, Mike, first, thank you for, for pulling us together to, to have this discussion. And, um, you know, I got into this space um, really around the passion around food waste. When you think about, you know, in mature markets, food waste is roughly 30% and a, and a very significant portion happening before it ever reaches the consumer. And when you talk about solutions such as an RFID solution, you have this, it's unique in that we all talk about the, the near-term benefits of sales, labor, efficiency, um, really driving inventory turns, but also this halo effect of freshness, traceability, mitigating food waste, and, and all the other you know, sustainability elements that go with that. Um, it, it's really an exciting time. Mm. Awesome. Jonathan? Yeah, you may have heard me say this before, Mike, but I would, I would speak to the value of standards and the value of community. So standards uh, uh, are in, a, in essence, a form of infrastructure, if you will, it's like getting on the highway, right? Mm -hmm. And if you think about it by following standards, you have your solution partners who produce tags a certain way, right? You have your academic and your, your standards organizations that give you this infrastructure where you can, you can pull off at a rest stop and be able to get this right. And, and you have the value of other people traveling on the highway, right? You have that community element where you can get together and, and meet up and either, uh, you know, being connected within your company, but within your industry uh, and that via say different avenues, including what GS1 US provides as far as work groups and discussion groups and, and points of contact there. Um, so I'd say, you know, standards are very important to follow and, and, uh, and very much a door opener uh, and, uh, you know, enabling the future uh, to, to not be more costly than, than you want it to be. So, uh, so yeah, that's awesome. final comments there. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. I probably should have started off with this story, but I have a personal interest in this topic. Um, we will, we always get our lettuce specifically from a big retailer who will go nameless because I'm about to throw them under the bus, but after about she, my wife buys these spring mix, which are in a plastic container. And she literally says after two and a half days, everything is gorpy. I don't even know if gorpy is a word, Adam, you're probably the professional at this, but gorpy <laughs> is a word to her, which basically means it's already going bad and it drives her nuts. 
so much so far that next year I've got to spend probably two weekends visit building raised flower beds because she wants to grow her own lettuce. So if you guys could solve this problem before next spring, so I don't have to spend two weekends building a flower garden, that'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. We really appreciate it. But the, the bottom line is customers are buying product, bringing it home, and they're frustrated over the freshness. So you guys are on the right thing. It's not going to be easy, just like Justin RFID with the first set of retailers wasn't easy. It was a lot of try it, do it, fix it. You know, that didn't work. Let's try this, et cetera. Um, people just have to get involved and really, to your point, Adam, what is the problem we're trying to do? Food waste, freshness, et cetera. It's the next big opportunity for this. So thank you guys very much for your time. Really do appreciate it. And uh, we will talk to you all later. Take care, everybody. Well, I hope you enjoyed that discussion about uh, RFID in the food industry. Pretty exciting to think you can leverage that kind of technology to eliminate food waste, ensure product rotation of product in stores, or either service restaurants or in grocery stores, and then being able to use that technology to quickly identify a gym inventory. Thanks for your time.